Good morning, and welcome to the final day of MedCity Invest Precision Medicine. I'm Stephanie Baum, Director of Special Projects with MedCity News. Uh, before we get started on our first panel of the day, focusing on clinical trial design, uh, let me give you some background about MedCity News. We were founded in late 2008 to cover innovation in life sciences and healthcare. We cover biopharma, digital health, medical devices, diagnostics, as well as hospitals and payers in the context of the industry's overall transformation. We host conferences focusing on a number of topics. In addition to precision medicine, we focus on investment, population health, digital health, and patient engagement. We also accept outside content through our MedCity Influencers Program. We also have a, a membership based program aimed at startups called Med Citizens, which provides uh, editorial and event benefits. If you'd like more information about this program, you can contact me at sbaum at medcitynews.com. Another program we have at MedCity News is MedCity Pivot. You can listen to our episodes on our website. And uh, if you have any interest in this program, you can contact our editor-in-chief, Arundhati Parmar, at aparmar at medcitynews.com. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Independence Blue Cross, which is the largest healthcare insurance organization in southeastern Pennsylvania and a longtime sponsor of MedCity events. Uh, I'd also like to thank Jay Pod at the University of Pennsylvania, which is part of the J&J &J Innovation uh, Program. I'd like to thank our, sponsor, our partners, uh, University City Science Center, MHIN, Health Wildcatters, Startup Health, and Argo Bond, Pond Consulting. And so our panel this morning is going to focus on clinical trial design trends. Our moderator today is Frank Vinluen, uh, a longtime business journalist with a particular focus on biotechnology. Most recently, he was senior editor at Exconomy, where he wrote and edited stories about a wide range of topics including cancer immunotherapy, cell and gene therapies, gene editing technologies, and rare disease drugs. Before moving into biotech journalism, Frank held business reporting positions at the Des Moines Register and the Seattle Times. He wrote his first clinical trial story as a staff reporter at the Triangle Business Journal. Frank is currently an independent contributor to several life science industry publications and websites. Our speakers on the panel include Peyton Howell, Executive Vice President and Chief Commercial and Strategy Officer with Parexel. Peyton joined Parexel in 2018 and provides leadership for the company's commercial and corporate business development, corporate strategy, marketing, corporate communications, and consulting businesses, including regulatory and access. She has more than 25 years of leadership experience in the healthcare industry, successfully delivering solutions to meet customer needs. In 2020, Peyton was named a luminary by the Healthcare Businesswomen's Association for her impactful work advancing women's careers and her dedication to healthcare. She serves on the board of directors of Tandem Diabetes Care, a leading insulin delivery and diabetes technology company, as well as the Cancer Equity Initiative for Family Reach, a national 501c3 organization dedicated to eradicating the financial barriers that accompany a cancer diagnosis. We also have on the panel Viraj Narayanan, Vice President, Life Sciences and Strategy at CODA. Uh, he leads the company's growth and development of life sciences partnerships and works with his team to leverage real world data to accelerate clinical development in the cancer space. A decision scientist by training, Viraj has worked in biotechnology research and advisory roles for life sciences and providers. Prior to CODA, he's spent nearly a decade in healthcare strategy at Hydric and Struggles Consulting and Decision Strategies International. Viraj earned an MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. He's, a passionate, he's passionate about the potential impact of healthcare technology and has co-authored articles on various healthcare topics in Inc. Magazine and Stats that News website. Finally, on the panel, we have Clay Williams, founder and CEO of Metadaptive Health. It's a company that is personalizing the participant experience and enabling remote support and monitoring to transform clinical trials. He has a PhD in computer science from Texas A&M University, and his scientific interests include com computational immunology, artificial intelligence, and 
combinational optimization. After his PhD, Clay did work in the areas of interoperability and decision support as a member of the clinical information system staff at Columbia University Medical Center. He then joined the IBM Watson Research Center as research staff member. At IBM Research, he led research teams on a diverse variety of topics, including software validation, software development governance, and data science and analytics. In addition to being passionate about transforming clinical trials, Clay is an avid mediator and an endurance cyclist. And now I'll hand the panel over to you, Frank. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, and uh, thank you to the panel. Uh, is everybody on? Looks like some, some of you are still on mute. Okay, so let, let's get started. Um, now, we're, we're talking about clinical trials and obviously clinical trials are about testing drugs, but I'd like to start by talking about patients. Is, is the patient experience overlooked in the, in the clinical trials process and, and how can that experience be improved? So Frank, this is Clay Williams. I'll, I'll take a stab at that one if I, if I may. Um, I, I believe the answer is yes. I think the, the, you know, there's so much that needs to get done in a trial. It's very easy to sort of think of the patient as, as yet another component that's in a trial. Um, I've experienced from many years ago being in a phase two and a phase three trial that were um, really influential and, and basically providing some life-saving treatment. Um, and it's a very alienating and isolated experience to, uh, to join a clinical trial and to deal with the uncertainties that, that go along with that. So you have everything from uh, trying to figure out if you're gonna meet the inclusion and exclusion criteria to get in where you're sort of pinning hopes on this process um, to the, the challenges of knowing, am I gonna be on a placebo arm if there is a placebo? If it's a dosing study that doesn't have a placebo, is there gonna be a dose that may not work for me or may cause a problem down the line? And then there's all the questions of the logistics, especially for people who are in trials with serious illness, site visits, um, uh, taking time off from work, dealing with uh, caregivers, et cetera. All of that is sort of um, feels unknown. I'm not gonna say that the sites and sponsors don't know that that's happening, but it feels unknown when you're in the trial. It's a, there's a sense that the clinical is the only thing that's happening, whereas the kind of the emotional experience of being in trials is, is really important. And if you just look at the attrition rates in trials, uh, what we believe at Medaptive is that by providing deeper support and, and trying to engage people and return them to a sense of safety and where it's possible autonomy, um, that you can start to really change the participant experience in a trial and, and that may in fact help with things like attrition, getting a trial done more quickly uh, and, and getting better data from people. Because studies have also shown that when people aren't, um, aren't, don't feel safe, they don't report data accurately. So PROs and other things may be affected. So I, I think the patient experience needs to be examined more closely. When you say support, what, what kind of support is that? So um, with, when you think about sort of what needs to happen, uh, people often have, first of all, just have questions and need to understand their trial, what's happening, and need to be reminded of that. So uh, you go into a site, you get some education, it kind of comes at you like a fire hose. Is there something besides a piece of paper that you lose in, I live in New York, so in the taxi on the way home or the Uber on the way home, is there something that can be done to provide people with resources that are visual, repeatable, things they can go back and look at and learn from, support for adherence, support for knowing what's gonna happen at their next site visit. Um, there's all sorts of things that people want to understand that, that could be supportive, that, that can be provided. Peyton, do you have yeah. some perspective uh, from the CRO world? I mean, what, what are you hearing from patients? How are you getting patient input? 
Yeah, thank you for the question. I'd love to add on to, to Clay's comments because he's spot on on the importance of the patient. And, and when we run clinical trials, how we aren't always factoring that in. Um, you know, of course, there's, there's inputs, right? We've always been getting real world data. We've always been getting input from, from sites. But now we really have learned exactly what Clay's described, that we really need to get insights directly from patients. One thing that we've done just this past year is invest in our own patient advisory councils for, as a CRO in terms of clinical research, not on behalf of specific sponsors, but for ourselves. We started a year ago, we've done seven of them. These have been global. So we've had the Americas, Europe and, and Asian, Asia experience. And I'll tell you, um, the learnings have really bit changed our company, frankly. Um, it's given patients a voice uh, and given all of our 20,000 employees, frankly, the patient story. One of the big learnings out of the first advisory council was just looking at that whole patient. So like Clay was describing and including mental health, actually that came up pretty um, pivotally actually in our first meeting. Also, you know, not making assumptions, right? Like looking at patient burden in a, in a wider range. And we've really seen that um, certainly throughout the pandemic. Um, we've reimbursed patients, for example, for certain things, but we got feedback from patients that we also need to be able to proactively give vouchers that just that having that cash was actually a challenge on some of the things that, that were required for them to be part of the sites. And then I think also just looking at the caregiver burden, we had some really powerful examples, um, including an example of an ALS patient where the caregiver, the spouse, you know, really questioned, do we need to have uh, the patient in this case, travel to a specific site, you know, for these lab tests, could it have been done in the community? And, and these are really, really important questions that impact patient retention, as Clay's talking about, in patient recruitment, and obviously, ultimately impact patients directly themselves. And, you know, the last thing that we've heard from patients um, in our work is that they want action. Um, they're willing to provide their insights, they've helped us priority, prioritize, but I can tell you already, we've had a report back on actions, changes that we're making across all of the clinical trials that we run, um, regardless of whether um, it's in the, the actual specs for that trial, actually bringing that patient voice to drug development and the drug development process. And the earlier that can start in trial design, frankly, the better. Um, so it's been a powerful experience for us to focus on, on the patient. I can tell you it's been a cultural transformation that, is, that has helped us actually through the pandemic because you put someone like Clay, right? You put a patient, right? In front of every action and every decision you're making and, and things feel very different. And you think about all aspects of that trial um, very differently. It's a great so question. Let's talk a little bit more about some of these changes. You mentioned clinical trial design. How is clinical trial design changing? Uh, and what is driving these changes? Yeah, I think everything's driving these changes that, that Clay described, but you know, what we're seeing is looking at the protocol is really one of the first spots, right? Are we unnecessarily including, excluding patients? Are we thinking about the patient journey and mapping that out? And then with the pandemic, we're really looking and embracing now decentralized clinical trials, which I'm sure is a topic we'll end up talking about quite a bit in terms of clinical trial design, but it's really helped to um, escalate, right? How quickly we're looking at these types of innovations and, and using them. And it may not be fully decentralized clinical trials. One thing we've heard loud and clear from patients is optionality. Some patients actually um, prefer going to a site. Some patients aren't comfortable with home type options. So everyone, you know, really wants that optionality. And we hadn't really thought of some of that in clinical trial design. You know, how do you incorporate that um, in a way to make it easy for patients and inclusive? And it's, it's challenged us, but I think it's really, really important as we look at, at the future of drug development. So some of these changes are, are obviously um, facilitated by advances in technology. Um, can the panel discuss some of the new ways data are being collected? What are, what's making these changes in clinical trials possible? Yeah, sure. I'll take um, a first stab at that. And, and thanks, Frank, Clay, and Peyton, and, and Med City. So appropriately timed discussion with um, the anticipated decision today of the FDA to approve a vaccine for COVID-19 to be talking about. Well, actually, it, it's a, it, they didn't decide yet. I think, unless they did while we were on the panel, it's, it's <laughs> emergency use authorization. Uh, the, the, the panel um, voted to recommend authorization. Correct, correct. Anticipated. <laughs> oh, go ahead. So I think the, 
one of one of the key um, sea changes that happened was five or seven years ago with both the 21st Century Cures Act and the Affordable Care Act, which for the first time ever mandated that sponsors think about alternative sources to traditional tr clinical trials in the context of regulatory decision making. And all of the, all of the credit here and forward thinking uh, deserves and goes to both the FDA as well as the patient advocacy groups uh, that really pushed and encouraged um, the need to rethink uh, data sources for clinical trials. Now, with that uh, recognition and framework five or seven years ago, there was also the recognition that for the first time ever, providers were going to be forced to adopt electronic medical records. There's gonna be an economic incentive and no longer are we gonna be in the paper chart world, we're gonna be in the digital world. And um, I don't know who coined it, it was probably a consultant. Um, this idea of real world data um, was, 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 was termed and real world data includes essentially all information that's clinically relevant outside of the traditional confines of a clinical trial. And since uh, over the past five to seven years, there's been uh, an industry that has emerged that's uh, adjacent and now converging with clinical trials, which looks at relevant information, whether it is through wearables, electronic health records, or other types of sensor information to help complement the traditional clinical trial information. And, and the idea is, and I think Peyton did a really great job of highlighting some of these changes, as patients have more options, as clinical trials become more precise uh, and narrow, we're moving to a world where we can start to leverage this alternative source of information to make faster go no go decisions in the clinical trial process and accelerate innovative therapies getting to patients faster. What are the challenges of, of these new technologies and new ways of getting data? Yeah, it's a great question, Frank. I think the, um, one, of the, one of the first things that anyone will tell you, uh, particularly someone like myself that lives, uh, lives in the electronic health record world day in and day out, is that the data is messy. It's not, it's not the same as a clinical trial where you have a patient uh, coming in at set time with set, um, set measurements. In the real world, a doctor is making those calls based on what they think is clinically the best decision. And, um, and the documentation of those decisions is limited to what is actually in the health record. So I think one of the key challenges in real world data is, um, is looking at missingness and looking at the clinically relevant data and also validating what is relevant in the real world. So as an example, at CODA, we're focused in, on, in oncology. So for cancer patients, when they come in and they're treated initially by the doctor, they receive a therapy, what is the, what is the appropriate uh, endpoint for measuring in the real world how they respond to that therapy? Is it a scan of the, um, of the cancer tumor and to, to indicate that the cancer tumor has, has shrunk? Is it looking at uh, blood reports or lab reports or pathology reports? How do we know that we're looking at the right valid measures in the real world? So that, that, that's, that's one of the key areas that CODA has been focused on. And I think the industry as a whole has been focused on as we look to consider these alternative sources of information. So yeah, that's, oh, go, ahead. Ahead. go ahead. It's such an important point that he just made actually about looking at the endpoints and how real world data can really change the game. Um, we've seen that in clinical trial design. So you look at real world data and real world evidence and we kind of use those two interchangeably to a large extent. It can help you identify unmet need, which might actually change the targets the endpoints, the clinical trial design, it might cause you to augment a clinical trial in new ways and look at, again, perhaps even utilizing that data as part of an external data or synthetic type control arm. So there's all different ways along this continuum that what Raj has just described can be used and really make a huge impact for patients. But the one that really gets me is, you know, we know of products that frankly, you weren't sure there was a commercial home for those products until you use real world data and understood the unmet need 
from the patient's perspective, right? Which is, you know, kind of turning everything on its head. So I think you just made a really, really important point, Viraj. And then to, to sort of weigh in also on the bringing, because the, the real world data piece is so important and the, the, the EPRO, the patient reported information, the, the data that comes from things like reporting at home, sensors, et cetera. Patients have a lot of questions about this and the FDA has a lot of guidance about this. This is where sort of the policy and the technology match and mismatch and for, for really good reasons. So patients all have questions like, can I use my own device? Do, do, does somebody have to ship me another phone that I need to carry to report data? And in some cases, the answer can be yes, you can use your own device. And in some cases it can be no. And that, that optionality that Peyton talked about is really, really important where, where it's possible to, to not burden somebody with additional things to keep track of in order to report information. Let's do that. And the FDA has done some very nice guidance with their My Studies app and some, some the Critical Path Institute's also done some work on bring your own device and, and, and how that fits in the context of, of trials. Uh, so the regulatory concerns around validation and val validity of data that, that Viraj was just talking about and the desires of patients to share what's going on in their lives also play in this real world data space in some really interesting ways. And we at Medaptive, we, we really look at both those pillars, you know, how do we support BYOD where it's appropriate and let people have the support on their apps? And how do we support, you know, more validated sort of constrained reporting where necessary in order to, especially if something regards the labeled use of a, of a, of a, of a drug, it's important to make sure the data you're collecting is val really validated deeply. Clay, are, are there things that, that you'd like to see from FDA? Do, do you need more guidance uh, on, on how data are collected, how devices are used? So, you know, I, I think what FDA has done a lot of work on around the My Studies app and around the use of some of these innovations that like um, research kit that came out of Apple and the research stack that came was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson community to sort of bring parity to Android. And the FDA has done some really nice work to try to help those communities understand where that technology is applicable and, and how to make use of it appropriately across different therapeutic areas. Uh, we participate in both those open source communities and, and the dialogues with the FDA around it. Um, where we're sort of in the wild west is more on wearables. Um, there are sort of the medically validated wearables from you know like Actigraph and, and Cambridge consultants and these organizations, but patients often ask the question, you know, I already have something. I have a, I'm wearing both a ring and a watch today that are measuring all sorts of stuff. Are those useful? If not, why not? If so, how? I don't think we've quite figured out that, that lay of the land at all. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of the, uh, a lot of open questions there uh, that'll be both technology questions and regulatory or technology validation regulatory around acceptability. And just to add on, Clay, you are right. We do need additional guidance and help, particularly related to wearables. Um, with, in the absence of some of that, I think there will be some sponsors that will be conservative in terms of the use. And that's certainly understandable. We all can push, patients can push, but you're making an important point, right? We really do need some of that to be clarified from a regulatory perspective for innovation to reach its, its full potential right now. And I love that you're wearing two wearables right now on the <laughs> panel. Yeah, we were um, in our... Um as we were prepping for the session, one of the companies that Clay and I were both talking about is a company called Electra Labs. And um, they're playing a really key leadership role in this exact space. And what they're doing is essentially looking at endpoints for wearables and what the right endpoints are from a scientific validation standpoint and offering that as a tool uh, kit, both to regulators as well as sponsors. And part of their goal is this is uncharted territory and new terrain, as uh, Clay and Peyton pointed out. We don't know, um, you know, Clay, you've got something, uh, on, you've got a ring and you've got something on your watch. You know, pick, pick sleep measures. Is it 
uh, REM? Is it the number of hours? What is the right measure that is scientifically valid? And so I think we need more companies like Electra uh, helping us guide in partnership with the regulator, in partnership with the sponsors, so we can we can try to navigate this new terrain. Okay. I want to jump back to a, a, a point, uh, a, a term that, that Peyton uh, threw out a few minutes ago. You, you mentioned uh, a, a synthetic control arm. So can you talk about what that is and um, why that's important, how that's uh, changing clinical trials? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm delighted to. And, and I should probably back up just a section, section, second to uh, make sure kind of I put the context to it. Um, so it really is part of that real world evidence discussion. How are we using real world evidence in new ways? And one of the examples I gave was a synthetic control arm. I will tell you the terminology is already changing. So you know you're an innovation when different people are using uh, different terminology. Analogous how we use uh, virtual clinical trials has moved to decentralized clinical trials. Some people are calling these synthetic control arms. Others are using external data control arms. Irregardless, it's use of real world data to create real world evidence as part of clinical research. And we actually have a kind of breaking news, uh, pivotal, pivotal study actually that of a product that's been approved and I'm, I'm happy to share it as a case study. And I think it's relevant to this audience, especially given I know so many people on this, uh, this call are really focused on adaptive clinical trials and precision medicine and patient centric uh, trial design. Uh, in this example, we now actually have an approval, uh, BLA approval, um, you know, and it's an oncology scenario. It is a rare disease within oncology. It was a phase two single arm open label study. And it was, because it was an unmet need, I think the FDA was, was open to a really unique partnership. And you know, innovation comes from those intersections of partnerships, right? Where you've got the sponsor, the clinical trial, um, and you know, obviously the CRO and the regulatory ex experts sitting down with FDA. And together, we were able to design a study um, where that instead of a placebo arm, the control arm actually was the real world evidence. And we ended up actually with a 100% match of those phase two study patients. So in some ways, you know, it's, it's better, right? Than, than any, you know, study you could have designed from a quality of data. So it's historic because it is that first approval where that synthetic or external controlled arm was used to demonstrate contribution of effect. And I think that's the moving the ball forward. We've all used RWE for uh, market access and expanded use for a, a long time, obviously, certainly um, for market access purposes. This is really now for that contribution of effect and labeling and being able to really have a new approval. So the result was speed. Um, fairly dramatic and you know it's hard to know right how much faster at least 12 to 24 months faster could be could actually be longer because since this was a rare disease I think patient recruitment would have been difficult and perhaps impossible um, if there was a placebo arm associated with this and then most important to me is it's patient-centric right this would be a clinical trial that you would gladly recommend your loved one uh, to be part of, right? Where the standard of care, um, you know, is the study and it can be integrated into the care option. And I think that's a really exciting advancement. We know this is a new area. Uh, we're gonna be looking at the end of the year of end of 2021 for the FDA to provide additional guidance in this area. But the draft guidance they put out has been critically important. It's paved the way to encourage this kind of innovation and sharing, which is why it's, I think, important to share in forums like this so we can all build upon it together. And we've seen globally um, more support for this, specifically in China. Uh, China's released guidance that actually built upon the USA and their draft guidance. So I think being able to continue to move the ball forward this year, particularly in a year of a pandemic, is gonna be critically important because you can move studies forward in these critical areas, life-saving areas where there's immediate you know, patient unmet need. So happy to share that as a breaking news uh, type study example. Yeah, to add to that, that's a great example, Peyton, and um, so encouraging to hear about. Uh, I think the two things that you said that resonate most to me are first, patient enrollment as a bottleneck. Uh, I think that there's probably not enough attention paid to this topic, but as advances in science have occurred, we are now targeting populations that are quite rare. And the best uh, way to quantify this is if you look at FDA clinicaltrial.gov uh, or Par Excel's website, I'm sure have, you can see that 10, 15 years ago, uh, 
clinical trials were in the thousands of patients, in some cases, tens of thousands of patients. And uh, today, particularly in oncology, um, we're able to stratify patients based on biomarker um, and all other different types of biologic prognostic factors. And the, the clinical trial today is no longer in the tens of thousands of patients, it's in the hundreds of patients. And uh, what Peyton is, um, is talking about is the idea of, of removing, uh, and this is the second point that resonates with me so much from a patient and ethics standpoint, removing a loved one from getting a placebo arm in a cancer trial. That's, what, that's really what we're talking about here. And um, at the end of the day, it's, 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 a huge, it's a huge and vast amount of patient impact that we can make with this type of uh, approach for synthetic control arms. So I love the case study and I'll probably, I'll probably ping you afterwards to learn more about that, Peyton. Happy to. It's, it's an ex we have to share it, right? So that we can obviously encourage this kind of innovation and, and move it forward. And I think from a patient perspective, um, that's where we could really also utilize the help for patients to be aware of these types of care options, take, take some of that concern away from clinical research. And you're right, Raj, there's not a clinical trial for, for cancer patients in particular that's probably not struggling right now with enrollment. Um, and significantly behind. So we're going to have to find new ways to be able to support patients and make clinical trials part of care. And, okay. and just to, to, to tag on this a little bit, because I love the example and I love what Viraj just shared as well about the, the changing nature of trials. You know, this is a precision medicine conference. And, and if you look at what's happening is because of precision medicine, because of our understanding of biomarkers and genomics, more and more conditions look like rare diseases. You know, yeah. they, they increasingly we see, and we face some of the same challenges. If we're doing a traditional study, the recruitment challenges are there that you have with rare diseases. Uh, real world evidence can really, really help with that. Uh, but once you get people in, you also want to keep them comfortable because that, that, the, these studies can be difficult to fill. And so the patient um, support, that whole participant support aspect comes back around once again as a result of the, the nature of precision medicine and, and the way these amazing treatments are, are very targeted. You know, if you think about what's happening in breast cancer, we, we do a lot of work with metastatic breast cancer. And, um, and those studies, as Varash was saying, are, are just very stratified into you know, the biologics, the immunologic trials, et cetera. And so um, it's important to make sure we, we think about the, the real world evidence holistically here. Clay, uh, um, I, I wanna jump back to something you mentioned a few minutes ago. You, you said that this is, uh, these cancers are, are, are more like rare diseases now. So to what extent do these, strategies apply to the clinical testing of rare disease drugs? Um, well, they become really, really important, the real world evidence strategies. So, uh, and Viraj, I know, knows more about this than I do, but if you look at, for instance, the inclusion of men on the Ibrantz label, um, that could not have been done through a traditional trial. You just never would have met recruitment goals to find out that Ibrantz was effective in men. So the label expansion there. So um, Ibrantz is, is a breast cancer drug? It's a breast cancer drug, yeah. And, and, and you know, it's, a, it's one of the biologics. It's, it's very, very successful in treating um, certain types of breast cancer. And the inclusion of men in that was done because of a real world evidence study. Um, you know, off-label use or compassionate use gave the basis. Viraj can talk at that about that, and probably Peyton as well. But that's an example of you know all of these methods we're talking about um, become important in some way uh, as as the world becomes more precise around what we can study. Yeah, I can add on to Clay's comments there, actually. Um, this is a precision medicine conference. So I, I wanted to take a look at what we're seeing with current clinical trials, meaning trials we're learning about right now. So haven't started yet, right? That are really in the developing phase. And I assumed that most would be precision medicine adaptive trials, that that would still be the, the biggest trend. What I found was actually that's the norm. 
that is the framework that literally there's not a trial in oncology, especially, um, but including other areas that really aren't built on the precision medicine framework. And I, I honestly, I was excited to see that stunned. And, and instead we're seeing, you know, the, the biggest trends and the biggest changes in, in the new studies coming are some of the areas like use of RWE. And then the second one was use of decentralized clinical trials or related tactics, building upon that precision med framework. So Clay, you're right. The data I'm seeing supports exactly what you just described. Raj, did you Yeah, I think um, I totally agree um, with Peden and Clay. And I think if you just think historically about that uh, decision, which was March of last year, the FDA made, um, it's pretty unprecedented um, to make a regulatory decision not based on clinical trial information, but based exclusively on real world data. And it, 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 it shows that for these rare populations, it, it, you can take an alternative approach. Uh, if, if in this in, in, um, instance, it's Pfizer who's the manufacturer of the CDK46 uh, product, which is called iBrands. And if they were to try to enroll, uh, and, and this product is traditionally, as Clay was pointing out, is for women with breast cancer, if Pfizer was to attempt, if you just think about the alternative, uh, this as a decision node, and one node is um, traditional approach. Let's run a clinical trial and enroll men with breast cancer to see how they, uh, they do. It's, it would take years and years and years to try to enroll that population because it's so rare. Decision node two, okay, we know that doctor, there, this, these patients do exist in the, in, in, in the real world. There are men with breast cancers, breast, with breast cancer. What happens to them? Well, what happens to them is doctors are uh, faced with this unique circumstance and need to make a decision. How do I treat this patient? And because, that, because of the fact that they, these doctors made a case to uh, the insurance company, or in, in some instances, Pfizer, to give this product off-label, i.e. Not, was, not what was traditionally in the, the package insert because it was not indicated for men, they treated those patients and all of a sudden you have a new clinical uh, source of data to see how do those patients, those men with breast cancer who were treated by those doctors who made the decision to give them an off-label product, why not use that data to inform should men with breast cancer, should that be on the label? And that's what the FDA did. That's what Pfizer did with collaboration from, from others. And it's, it's, it's a really enormous impact story of the power of uh, collaboration and considering decision node two, right? Thinking differently. Okay. How do you ensure the criticism that real world data introduces variables that don't exist in the experimental arm? Yeah, you have, we found we had a partner with the FDA to do that. So uh, we ended up scouring, I think we started with more than 13 different data sources and really aligning with the FDA, even down to the data source and the specific match. You could easily argue, wow, that almost seems like it's overdone. Um, but I think that's the caution that makes sense at this point in time. And I think as we all partner as an industry with regulators, we're gonna find pathways to, to support that. Um, but you know, these examples are incredibly powerful. So it, it's worth the work. And we're seeing sponsors say the same thing, that it's worth the work, um, particularly because it allows those treatments to get out to patients so much quicker. Yeah, to build on that, I think, um... This is why the term fit for purpose exists in the first place is um, before we go down the path of identifying what data source you need to use to answer the question, we need to understand what the purpose is. And to Peyton's point, if you're trying to match a trial to the real world, you have to start with the trial criteria and uh, the trial criteria has to best match the data source ultimately. And so that's what's so uh, compelling about the case study that she was talking about uh, with 100% matching is that if you do do that right, the proper framing and diligence with the regulator up front, that opportunity does exist. But 
it's one that we really need to emphasize in the beginning um, steps of, of, of approaching a decision like that. Okay. Um, so I wanna jump and uh, in, in talk about uh, COVID-19 uh, since that's the, the big topic of, of the day, uh, the year. Um, so obviously the disease revealed disparities in its effect on, on uh, different racial groups. Uh, and that in turn highlighted the need for diversity in clinical trials, testing uh, vaccines and, uh, and therapies. So how can diversity in clinical trials be improved and, and uh, what role, if any, can technology play in that? So, I'm happy to jump on the beginning or I, Clay, do you wanna do the technology first? <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll take a shot and then turn it over. That, that, Sounds good. I, I think the, you know, the, the disparities are very real and very important. If you just look at what happened during the COVID vaccine trials, what we even learned there was that there were certain vaccines that were slowed down because of recruitment problems. Uh, the FDA rightfully said these populations that have been hit hardest need to be represented in the trial so we can understand what's happening in those populations. Um, and the, there's all sorts of problems in terms of, of trust, in terms of um, trial education. There are different problems related to social determinants of health that need to come into play to, re to recruit geographic diversity. So my, my stepmother had lung cancer. It was metastatic from the colon. The nearest trial to her was 10 hours away. Uh, this is in, we live in far West Texas. And, and that kind of drive once a month to, to participate in the trial, you know, that is a, an issue of geographic diversity and understanding, you know, sort of what, what, how do we bring a broader population into, uh, into the study? So educational material that uh, speaks to the concerns and the, the aspirations of diverse populations um, is really important. And then in the recruitment, you, you, know, you kind of have to address head on the problems and then the reasons people have hesitancy of joining trials. You can't ignore it and, and, and simply believe that um, uh, these problems go away over time. They don't, you know, we, we, we know that. So the, this patient support piece uh, and the ability to do sort of segmented patient support and find out how, how we support people where they are as opposed to treating the population as a lump is really key. And that's one thing that we've put a lot of time into at Medaptive. Yeah, that's, that's really important work. And you brought up ge geography, which is critical because sometimes we think just about ethnobridging, which is essential, but it also impacts within countries, right? That accessibility is another part of clinical trial diversity. And, you know, I'm really optimistic that we are at a pivot point um, to really put metrics to this and real change. Um, we've all been listening uh, to patients. We've actually convened a specific uh, patient advisory council focused only on diversity in clinical trials and continue to gain insights. But we're also learning we're gonna have to invest. And that means, uh, put metrics up front, hold everyone accountable, and then seek out and really engage diverse PIs and diverse sites and sites that might be new to clinical research to be part of this. And that's part of the ecosystem that we need to change. And certainly decentralized clinical trials give me also a hope because you're right, that's the concept, right, of bringing clinical trials into the community, into the home, um, can also certainly support the ge geographic piece and all elements of diversity. But we have to be open to, you know, a much more challenging clinical trial design than going to the same sites that we have secure success. Yeah. Um, this is going to require a lot of, of extra work and investment and, you um, you know, we have, it's the right thing to do um, clinically in terms of outcomes. And it's obviously the right thing to do for patients. So hopefully the time is now, but it is one, I think we need to keep raising the dialogue so we don't lose the momentum, um, you know, during this period of time. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked the question, Frank. And I, um, Clay, Pete and I, I think all share a similar passion for this topic. It's a, it's, 
and with the social, I would say the social movements in this country this year, it's um, it's actually an enhanced platform, I think, to eat, to talk about this as 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 an issue because it, it's a fundamental problem in the U.S. And I don't think that it's one of uh, easy solutions. I think I I really do think it's a structural and almost cultural and trust issue. Uh, when you look at the numbers, diversity and inclusion, we're not we're, we're not doing we're we're failing there in large part um, in 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 relation to clinical trials. Um, if you in oncology where I live, for example day in and day out, uh, one of the diseases that we spend a lot of time on is multiple myeloma. And in multiple myeloma, in the clinical trials, uh, blacks are dis disproportionately affected, yet are significantly underrepresented in, in, in the trials themselves by almost an order of magnitude of times four or times five. And so I think that there's a lot of, a lot on the culture and the, the trust side of the equation. It's actually not a technology issue that needs to be done to um, bring those communities uh, into the trials and to have them have a bigger voice um, and bridge, bridge the trust issues that do exist. Okay. Um, so the trust, it's, uh, that, it doesn't seem like that, that's something technology can address or, or can it? I don't think so. so. I don't think it addresses trust, but I think it can be a conduit. So I love what Peyton said about diverse investigators and diverse, you know, going, to, and this requires real important foresight and, and, and attention. The structural issues that Viraj was just talking about, you know, um, making sure that people know that there are people in their community who they know, who they trust, places that they receive care that can be trial sites and investigators there that they can know um, is really key. And then technology is an adjuvant sort of with the ability to provide uh, a conduit that, it, that gives them the opportunity to provide feedback and to receive information that keeps them comfortable in a trial. Um, so it's not the solution, I completely agree, but it is uh, a piece of the puzzle. Um, because in a trial, having something that helps you manage the day-to-day -day anxiety of participation, it's not just about the site visit. It is, there is a day-to-day -day issue that technology can help with. And that's really, really key to note. I love that quote. That's going to be quotable, I think, from this because it's, you know, technology conduit or as an enabler of the solution is something that we're really not talking about in the dialogue. So Clay, I think that's a really good addition. And Viraj, you're right. This trust one is, is, is big. Um, and I think we can only do it by investing, you know, in, in PIs and sites. But that cultural awareness training is going to be a big piece of this. Improving patient communications, we know, is a foundational issue. Um, so there's a lot of work to do. And it's going to mean working with diverse community leaders to really build that trust in terms of clinical trial messaging, um, particularly in the United States. Okay. Um, I'm getting some questions in the chat now. Uh, so I've, I have one on diversity. We agree on the diversity problem. What are the biggest bottlenecks in getting diverse populations in clinical trials? How do we move forward? Well, I would weigh in on that one. I think one of the, the biggest is we have a number of amazing sites around you know, the world in terms of clinical research, but they're not always representative of diversity. And that's particularly cute actually in the United States. So we're gonna need to invest in a different model. Sometimes it is the hospital across the street, actually, um, that, that we need to go to, but that's, that's changing how we do business. And with the challenges in patient recruitment, that's more work and potentially more time. So it's investments we need to make, but the payback will be enormous. But, but what, what are the specific bottlenecks? Uh, we're not at the right sites. We're not at diverse sites and we don't have diverse investigators. So I think that's the, that would be an immediate bottleneck to a trial today. I think um, to add to that, I think education and transparency are two key levers that we need to pull. Um, on the education front, I think about one of our one of our sites is in South Florida, and um, 
we we've talked to them and they've shared that one of the things they need to prove, improve on is having more communication and education related to being in Spanish. And without having that education um, or communication built in, they're, they're not getting the yield that they would like in their clinical trials. On the transparency front, I think one of the steps that the FDA has done a great job on is trying to be more transparent related to the actual ethnic makeup of trials. So a couple, a couple of years ago, they mandated a new policy um, that they call drug snapshots. And so now you can, every, any average citizen can go to the FDA's website and see for each trial what the demographic and ethnic breakdown of trials are. So I think related to transparency, we need more of those types of initiatives to share how we're doing with the broader population. I, I'll, I'll wrap with, I do think one of the, there's very few silver linings of COVID-19 in this year, but one of the silver linings is I do think, I really believe that there's more attention that's ever been given from a public standpoint on clinical trials. I think average everyday citizens now know the difference between a phase one and a phase three, and that's, that is good. That, and I think that will help as well. No, you're right. Now we need to build upon that momentum, right? Uh, we've got the opportunity, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. And we really do need to build upon that, both in terms of protecting the innovations that we had in clinical research, but in the public awareness of, of clinical research. It's a great point, Baraj. Okay. I've got another question. Uh, have any drugs or therapies received FDA approval that use data gathered from remote monitoring, remote mon monitoring tools as part of clinical trials? Has to be. I mean, remote monitoring is not yeah. new. The use is, you know, obviously at a different spectrum, but um, absolutely, I think there can be confidence, you know, in, in those tools and, um, you are frankly adding more quality investment um, because of the changes that we're seeing in the growth of remote monitoring. Yes. Yeah, I would, I would concur. It, it may not be, uh, you know, when we think about remote monitoring in our world today, we, we tend to think about the sexiest applications. If you look at the drugs that have been approved, they've largely, largely been EPRO, ECOA, sort of, you know, th that kind of remote monitoring. But there have definitely been um, decisions made that, that, that involved that data as a core part of the submission. Yeah, in, in uh, uh, COVID has has uh, shut down or delayed a lot of clinical trials this year, and and that's forced some of the uh, CROs to make some changes in how they collect data. So how how are clinical trials changing now? Are we going to be seeing more remote monitoring, uh, re remote collection of data? What, what do you see? Yeah, I'll I'll take that one to start, and would love the the panel to add on, but. Yeah, everything has changed. I am incredibly proud of how all of us together as an industry have pivoted um, in, in response to COVID. And when you really look at how quickly we were able to get studies back online and keep studies online. And I think knowing how many patients where that clinical trial is actually their only care option um, was really a motivator, obviously, to make sure that we were keeping things progressing. Um, and we, as an industry, really have done incredibly well working and partnering with sites. Now we need to make it easier for sites as part of that. Remote monitoring is a big part of the change. And then I think decentralized clinical trials and new strategies there um, that make it easier for patients, but also easier for sites as well, um, are some of the sustained change that we need to, to look forward to. But I would say we have work to do right? We have incredible guidance that came out um, in the beginning of the pandemic from the FDA and that we have some protections, but we need clarity for the long term related to these changes so we can protect these innovations. Regulatory clarity? That's right. Mm -hmm. Clay? Yeah, so, you know, if, if you think about this whole question of pause trials, um, this was a huge source of anxiety for, for, for patients, especially with patients in oncology and, and in, is my trial pausing? Or if, if the protocol is being amended, um, am I going to be at risk of an adverse event that falls through because I'm not being monitored as often? You know, there are all sorts of questions that came up for patients in the midst of what went on as a result of COVID. Um, I, I have to give 
Peyton a shout out because we talked to CRO partners um, at the early days and just the work that was being done to update SOPs and get protocols amended and get everything done to try to keep these things moving forward. It was heroic work, you know, and, and, and this is work that went on unrecognized if you aren't in the trial space. So it's really important, but that patient comfort piece uh, to, re to keeping people in so you can restart and, it, and then if people need to be rescreened or other things need to happen as a result of a pause trial, it's really important to be transparent as to what's happening. And this is an area where that patient engagement and patient support can make a difference and also keep people um, you know, from having mental health or other problems as a result of the, the challenges. Okay. So I, I wanna ask, um, looking, looking ahead, what will clinical trials look like in, in a post COVID-19 world? Have, have we made, has COVID-19 made permanent changes to how clinical trials are run or will be run? I can start, I know we're almost out of time and um, I think we are very optimistic uh, that absolutely clinical trials and the innovation we've seen um, through the pandemic is one of the silver linings as Viraj said, is this innovation and it absolutely um, will change and move forward. I think we all have work to do to make sure from our regulatory perspective that that's supported. But I do think that the changes that we've seen are, are gonna be sustained. And I'll just weigh in, I'll say, uh, I really think so and hope so. If, if they aren't, it's a huge missed opportunity. If we don't push these to be the, the, the way we do business, we will really shortchange patients and cures. And, and, um, and so we need to make sure it sticks. Okay, Raj? Nothing to add, I agree, <laughs> I concur. <laughs> All right, um, well, we are at time and uh, I think that, that should wrap things up. I just wanna thank the panelists for taking the time to share their perspectives on, on clinical trials. And I'll, I'll throw this back to Stephanie. Thank you so much to our speakers and our audience. We look forward to seeing you at the next MedCity Invest Precision Medicine session.